Shopping experiences are very different today than they were decades ago. The brick and mortar experience has largely given way to digitally optimized and enhanced shopping options. And one product sector in particular appeals to Wendy Wong. That is eyewear. During the pandemic with all the Zoom stuff, people were only seeing my face. And so I had been building up my collection. Those are now outdated because I need reading glasses power as well. So I'm building my new collection. But it's also kind of funny because I spent most of my childhood actually avoiding glasses. I have really, I used to have really bad vision. I had my vision corrected and now I'm aging. So I need glasses again, unfortunately. So I thought, I thought I'd have some fun. What was once a frustrating shopping experience, often in a stuffy optometrist's office, is now much less stressful. And with so many interesting and colorful eyewear options hitting the market all the time, Wendy figured, why stick with just one? Right now, I'm just trying to build out different shapes and textures. So like the glasses I have on, like they're white, but they've got this fun marbling, which I thought was really great. Um, and I've got the other pair that matches these, which are brown and more traditional, but I like the shape of these. Um, and then I brought, I have another pair. So this is my newest set, which I just love because they're fun and they're big. And I think they work really well. Um, I mean, one thing I found when doing public talks is like most people can't see your face, but if you've got like glasses on that are pretty distinctive, it's nice because then people have something to focus on, you know, when they're watching you talk, but they're not exactly right in front of you. So, yeah. And anyway, that's I have it's a, it's an obsession and probably going to end up costing me a lot of money, but <laughs> it's it's fun. It's fun to experiment. Eyewear is no longer an accessory that most people dread wearing. It can even help you accessorize or augment your personality, especially where your co-workers might only see you from the shoulders up. Especially since the pandemic, a lot of us have really gone for some fun eyewear. So like my, my parents, we, we have this conversation about my eyewear all the time and they, they like my more subtle looks. Um, they think that glasses should not be seen, but I think that, you know, so, sort of the opposite. It's part of your outfit, right? I mean, I, especially people who have multiple options now, you just sort of pick your shirt with the glasses that you think fit best, or maybe it's just the day. So some days, you know, I don't feel like wearing my, you know, this, these options, and so I've got other options to sort of stick with. So I think it's, it's become a really fun experience. When I was a kid, I remember I had these really loud teal marbled glasses, like, you know, different shape, but not unlike these, like sort of fun pattern. And I remember like most people didn't have that. They had like just one color or, you know, your little wired glasses. And so now like even, so one of my kids actually had to start wearing glasses because he's very farsighted and he's starting to read and do math and stuff. And so his glasses are pink and purple. And like, that would not have been a thing when I was growing up. I don't remember glasses being all different colors and being able to be crushed by a car and still work. <laughs> That's just amazing. This is the Ready Tesco podcast brought to you by Applause. I'm David Cardi. Today's guest is eyewear aficionado and professor Wendy Wong. Wendy is the professor of political science and principles research chair at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. She has written three books, including We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age, which published earlier this month. Businesses are awash in data, more than they know what to do with. This data drives business decisions and it can help improve a consumer's experience with your brand. But massive data collection and management can also have negative effects on the consumers from whom all of that data derives, especially where data collection is such a widespread undertaking with little legislation to protect consumers. So how significant a change is the datafication of our society? Wendy has argued that datafication is as influential a development in human history as the invention and proliferation of the printing press. Take that, Gutenberg. With those high stakes in mind, Here's Wendy to chat about data rights, digital products, and aligning expectations between businesses and consumers. Wendy, let's start out with a distinction. What's the difference between human rights and data rights, and what motivated you to write about these subjects? So I, I started writing a book about data, and I think the first thing that people think about with regard to data and human rights would either be something about data rights specifically or something, let's say, around privacy. 
And so one of the things I really wanted to do with this book was to um, open up that that aperture a little bit to like make sure that people think about human rights, not just in terms of these very specific types of rights. So either one that we think is being threatened, like privacy, or one that people think should should arise because of AI and datafication, this idea of data rights. And so one of the things I'm hoping we'll talk about a little bit more is why it's important to, to think about all the human rights that we have and also the values that underlie the whole framework we have around human rights today. But I also think that when people think about data rights, they tend to think about it in terms of market relationships. So a lot of times, and there's a lot of writing about data rights, a lot of times people think about, quote, my data, right? Or, or you know, like some individual person's data, it belongs to them. But actually, as I, as, you know, I explore in my book and I explain why, it's actually really uh, not accurate to think about data about you or data that have come from you as, quote, yours, because data are co-created. It's not just you as a data source, but it's also a data collector has to actually do the data making and storage and analysis. And so I make that really big distinction there. And I think I think this is why talking about data rights has been, a, you know, I, I don't think that's the right framing, because I think it then sort of makes it a market relationship, but then also makes data as sort of a unique set of maybe property, creates property rights around data in a unique way that I don't think actually um, help in terms of thinking about what's problematic about datafication. It's not just that we can't claim monetary value from data. I think that's only one part of what's changed about human experiences with data. We're also talking about changes in social and political relationships. We're talking about cultural shifts in terms of how we relate to one another as fellow human beings and across societies. And so when we talk about data rights, we're often talking about only economic relationships. And so in this book, I really wanted to back it up to think about human rights as part of the, uh, you know, thinking about the human experience and how that is shifted with uh, emerging tech. Now, it might be hard to paint with a broad brush here, but what's your assessment of where individuals stand today in terms of their data rights, data awareness, and the usage of all of this data in the present day? Some people do survey work around, you know, how, how much knowledge people have and what they feel about, you know, either AI or thinking about data about their activities and their thoughts. But my sense of that work is that there are, there are, you know, what we might call a have nots and a, and a have group. And the, and the have group is much smaller than the have not. So there are lots of really, you know, smart and well-trained people now who work in data sciences or computer science or computer engineering or other fields where they're, they're used to working with massive quantities of data, what we used to call big data. They're, they are familiar with algorithms and they're familiar with all the advanced techniques that are being developed. And those folks are really comfortable in knowing what the technology can do or, or not do. And I think some of them are, are concerned about the implications. I think most people though, have probably now heard enough about um, AI and how it's changing our lives, but don't necessarily then have the tools to then think, so now what, right? So how are data being made? What are some basic understandings we can have of, of AI that, that would make it more tractable for us to, to get our heads around what's going on? So I, I think that most people have been exposed to understanding like the apps we use or you know underlying many underlying social and economic functions are data are run by by AI, but then they don't know what to do about it. And I think this is why part of my motivation for writing the book is to promote this idea of data literacy as a human right, so that we, we can sort of close the gap between the haves and the have nots in terms of, of knowledge and, and comfort. Right. And you just touched on this concept of data literacy. Uh, why is it important to gain data literacy skills and what resources might be available to help with that task? Typically, when we think about literacy in, in our day and age, we're thinking about reading and writing, and sometimes people talk about arithmetic, right? The, the three R's, so to speak. Um, and I think that that's something that has come because of, of you know, widespread education and basic education and, you know, in, in, in industrialized countries, but increasingly around the world. People are becoming 
more people are literate than than not in these these ways and when we think about what literacy actually is it's not necessarily the skills of reading and writing right it's the ability to be competent in society the ability to communicate with others and get things done that you need to do in a data on a day-to-day -day basis without um with with confidence uh with a basic understanding of what's going to happen um and with the basic understanding that you are on similar footing with the person you're interacting with that's literacy so it, it's become clear i think and it became clear in the in the process of writing the book um that if we don't think of data also as one of these pockets where we need to have competence, we need to have literacy, we're going to be creating a gulf between people who know a lot about data and about emerging tech and people who don't. And, you know, that's going to create increasingly disparate outcomes. And we're already seeing that in terms of how people understand the systems that they're using and, and the consequences of, of that. So, so data literacy is a way to think about the specific need to have data understanding and data skills. So that doesn't mean everyone's going to be a data scientist. That would make you a data expert. Um, we just need competence. We need literacy, which means understanding the basics of what data are. So thinking beyond digital data, actually, understanding how data are made, what kinds of choices go into the creation of data, and how those choices actually really can affect the outcomes that you get. And so understanding the relationship between the data that the algorithms are analyzing and understanding that actually the data shape as much of the output as the algorithmic assumptions that are built into those models, right? Right, and you mentioned how data collection and analysis can have disproportionate effects on different members of the population, Absolutely. right? So that kind of leads into the next question a little bit. Can you explain what it means to have sticky data and how the stickiness of data might sometimes disproportionately affect individuals based on characteristics like race, income level, or any other number of criteria? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that is challenging for human rights um, as a, a framework of legal and, and sort of social and political norms is the stickiness of data. And, and so everyone knows that digital data in particular are really easy to transfer and copy, right? That's why they've become so predominant in the way that we store information and, and how, you know, it sparked tons of, of you know, financial and informa the information revolution, right? Because of digital data. But we don't tend to think about, you know, the stickiness of data, which means like it's actually stuck on each and every one of us as individuals, kind of like gum gets stuck on our, our shoes. Like it's really easy to, to step on gum and you may not be aware of it. And it's actually pretty tough to get rid of it. And so this is actually the, the analogy I wanted to make when we talk about data about people. So they're really easy to make for, for four reasons that I talk about in the book. The first is that basically a lot of the data being collected about people are very mundane and they may not even be conscious behaviors or things that we think of as as some subject of data collection, right? So, so a lot of data are about like daily things we can't help but do, um, you know, like if you wear a smartwatch or you have a smartphone, things like waking up, how much you sleep, how many steps per day you're taking, hard to avoid those things. Um, or, the, you know, if we think about how we text or how often we make typos, these are all data that are being collected about us that we, we can't really change a lot of these things. So they're mundane. And because they're mundane and everyday, because they're hard to avoid, that's the first reason that data are sticky. Another reason data are sticky is because data don't just stay nicely in a single data set, right? So we know that once data are collected, they get bought and sold, they're used in various ways that are perhaps very different from the original data collection intent. So data are linked together. And that leads to, and is also part of the reason why data are sticky, because they're effectively forever. So when, you, when data are created about people, they don't, we don't, we don't know what happens to them. And so because we don't know what happens to them, we should be assuming they're effectively immortal. Even if they get deleted, we don't know that. We can't verify deletion. And the final reason why data are sticky is what we talked about a little earlier. It's this idea of co-creation. So it's not just me making decisions about whether data are created, right? I'm a data source, everyone's a data source, and there are only some who are data collectors. They're the ones who are making decisions about what behaviors, what activities, what thoughts to be creating into digital data. Another reason why 
we can think of data as co-created though is because a lot of times data are not just about us. In fact, we know that data are valuable because not because of they're from me as an individual, but because they can be pooled into different, um, different, you know, we can make different pools of data of people like us. And so data are valuable in the aggregate, they're collective in other words. So the other aspect of co-creation is to think about how data have collective implications and also multiple sources. So think about if, you know, when people post pictures of you on social media, have you always agreed to that? Not, not usually, but there's then now data about you out there that you didn't actually directly make. Right. And there are positive and negative ways Absolutely. of looking at that, right? I mean, it might be seen as a positive that you can pitch a product to a certain type of person, right? But then there are also plenty of negative ramifications there too. T to your point about immortal data, you write in the book uh, with the quote, the boundary between living and dying in a datafied world is increasingly fuzzy. And you spend a whole chapter in the book discussing these so-called digital remains and how our data outlives us. So what protections should be in place for those who have died? And is anyone beating that drum for data rights protection for the deceased? Yeah, I mean, so just back to your comment, right? There are, there, the whole book is about trade-offs. I mean, that's essentially what it is. It's to think about the trade-offs of datafication through a human rights lens, through the, the values of autonomy, dignity, equality, and community. So, I think actually thinking about what happens to data when we die, but also really it's, it's about what happens to data once created. It's out there. It's out of our individual control because it's, it, again, it's not our data, right? It's data about us, data taken from us in our, in our activities. So I think that's this chapter about data what hap and what happens when you die. It's actually, I think it sort of nails that home because it, it does show that because of datafication, we have less agency over what people know about us. We have less autonomy. So, so in that sense, you know, it really, really hits against that. And also, I think it, it pushes against our questions of dignity. You know, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be treated as so, as someone with inherent worth? And what does it mean when people can take data? from your activities when you're alive to generate either a, a copy of you somehow, a digital copy, or to approximate you while you're still living, right? And to create a digital double. Really raises questions about whether data are, are whether we treat data as though they come from human beings, which means they have inherent worth, or that they're just, they're commodities to be traded on the market. So that's sort of, sort of stuff that I really touch on um, in addition to equ uh, equality concerns, we know that these sorts of bots and, and programs are not for everybody. They do take a certain amount of, of money to do. And so not everyone wants to or even can access these kinds of tools right now. And they also change the way we think about communities that we live in. If we're interacting now on a regular basis with a, a bot that approximates um, a person who's died, what does that mean about the line between living and dying. It used to be when you died, you stopped interacting with people in, an, in a very active way. And, and I think now that's, that's changing. And it, to get to your question about safeguards, I, I would say there's not a whole lot in place. So, you know, I think lawyers now, you know, state lawyers are thinking about digital assets, for example, so that, you know, you can choose to bequeath your digital assets to whomever, as you would a car or a house or money or whatnot. But I think the catch there is, and you know, having looked at these sorts of documents recently myself, they're very vague. So digital assets could mean your login to your, you know, an account that your Amazon account or your email account. It could also mean the data that are generated from your activities. But because we don't actually have a sense of that we don't we don't have claim or ownership over the the mass of the data that can be used to to generate this digital double um that's actually a real issue right so how do we protect people from this i think part of what we need to do is to exactly reevaluate what this means for autonomy while we're alive for dignity while we're alive and how how can we take people's wishes into account given that we have so much data about everyone and given that that is a, a reality 
that we have to deal with. Do we, d does this mean going forward, we don't collect certain types of data, we practice data minimization? Um, does this mean that, you know, there are certain term limits for, for holding on to data or using data? I, I don't know, there are lots of different potential ways, but we right now there's not much one can do. I, I mean, even if, if you didn't sign over your digital assets to somebody, that's not gonna stop companies from still holding the data that they've already collected, right? Absolutely, not a lot of protections out there for uh, for data subjects. And, and speaking to that, we've seen some legislation around data privacy rights, right? I yep. mean, particularly coming from the EU, and that impacts businesses all over the world. What can we expect in the future for legislation, and how do you see that affecting how businesses design and develop digital products? So you point out the EU has had has probably the most developed um, regime of thinking about not just AI but also what to do with data about people and 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 I think you know for example Canada where I live is also following similarly in the EU's footsteps with upcoming legislation that will you know that is going through the parliamentary per, more parliamentary process. Um, I th so, so the data, the way that d people think about data has tended to be about individuals and individual choice and individual consent. So, you know, like, do you personally consent to the collection of these data? And if you do, then, then that's considered legitimate. But there's also this question of de-identified data, right? De-identified data are not covered by, by these data regulations. And I would say that probably the you know, the most important, some of the most important data can be de-identified, but that doesn't take away from the fact that they come from individuals, they come from human beings. So I think that's something that we really need to think about. I mean, in terms of companies complying, I, you know, we've seen it, like I've experienced it as a consumer, I've experienced it, you know, in looking at my research, like companies are responding as much as they can to the idea that, you know, that they can be subject to auditing, that that people have the right to to you know take port their data at all these different things, and we can choose whether to have cookies, you know, record analytics on on websites. I think maybe companies can also be a bit more proactive about what they think, not just in terms of data from individuals, but how we treat the data that are pooled together, um, that are de-identified, that are pseudonymous. You know what? What are the data? What what data do companies actually need? I think that's really the key um, in order to recenter a human rights framework. Is that you know, as I said before, it's trade offs. You know, there are improvements that can be made from gathering data about individuals and and and, and about groups. And I don't think that companies should cease data collection altogether, or or you know, go, or governments. I mean, we're just sort of at the point where. We're having data about populations helps us improve people's lives, right? In, in some ways. What I think needs to happen though, is we need to really think about and be more reflective about what, what to what extent are we over collecting data? Because I think that a lot of times the impetus, especially in, you know, more data intensive fields is just to take the data that they can and think about it later. And so you end up with all these data that have never been touched or have really no, no stated purpose in advance, and yet they exist. And so part of what I think is that we need to resist that urge and, and really be more reflexive to think more about the idea of data minimization and how human rights can give us the moral framework around which to build a, a, a norm out about data min minimization, right? So it's one thing to say, we need to minimize what we collect. So on what basis do we do that? I think thinking about dignity and autonomy and equality and how data can degrade communities, that's really where we should start thinking about data practices. Right, and from a business standpoint, being more efficient with your data is also going to reduce costs over time, Absolutely. right? I mean, it costs money to, st to store all of this data and it opens you up to more risk from intrusion, yep. from things like that, yep. right? So thinking about a, a, a more steady cadence and useful, uh, the usefulness of the data that you're collecting uh, serves multiple purposes, hum humanitarian purposes and business purposes. Yeah, yeah that's a good um, point. And, and to think about this from another perspective, so there's a user's perspective on all of this too, right? If we're talking about being more mindful about human rights and digital rights, 
what the what should the user's expectations be for a digital product as it pertains to how it manages data? If we can rethink about how we interact with digital products and create an expectation for data privacy and collection, is that going to be enough to move the needle for tech companies who stand a profit off of these data collection efforts? I think one thing we need to do is stop thinking about it as privacy, because I just, you know, it's not that privacy is not important. And I don't want to come off as saying that because I, do, I don't believe that. It's, it's a fundamental human right. But the way we've thought about privacy um, in, the, in the North American context in particular is that we're keeping people out. We're, you know, we're keeping somehow keeping a barrier, right? Privacy is about, about maintaining a barrier between me and everybody else and including, you know, prying eyes and, and the physical intrusion. And just given the nature of the technologies that have that have been developed in the last 20, 30 years, I just don't see that as, we have to rethink what that actually means. It's not, and, and so when we talk about privacy of data, what is it, what is private? What is personal, right? And so, you know, what, what types of biometric data are, are, actually quote private and and i think one of the things that i've really thought about a lot is is thinking about how we can use a, a technology like facial recognition technology to serve to serve purposes that are are you know beneficial for society without resulting in you know the the discrimination of certain groups without resulting in um thinking that our privacy has been violated and if we think about faces and facial recognition technology to say that faces are private is actually kind of a it's a it's a funny distinction to make because we use our faces in social interactions right they're very much our identity we i think our identities are often um you know very much rooted in our in our having our face i you know we identify with our faces but thinking about it as privacy is really I think not the right way. I think facial recognition technologies violate our autonomy. I think they violate our conce conceptions of human dignity when we start using the technology in ways to to randomly or or uninformedly either target certain populations or use as evidence in a very wrong and and you know unhelpful way. So so I think part of it is that. I think companies need to be. I think companies need to be more open in talking about how these technologies might affect future choices. For example, that would be an autonomy, um, an idea around autonomy. But I think talking in terms of privacy and and you know that sort of language is important. But it's also really important to to say like you know there are certain things that aren't necessarily privacy that still are problematic that still hurt our autonomy and our dignity or our our chances of of being you know treated equally in society and they need to think probably through the worst case scenarios too right of this data running amok because you could see the flip side of the coin where somebody might argue well facial recognition in a law enforcement context exactly. is an ethical use it is serving a good purpose well there's a downside to that a clear downside to that including discrimination and other potential negative side effects, right? So it's kind of uh, opening up that discussion and being open to the positives and negatives of the technology, right? Yeah, and, and understanding that, you know, these are technologies that human beings ultimately use. And so understanding that there are, you know, there are problems with the technology that are inherent in, so the inherent problems being that they are very data-driven and that as a result, we have to, we have to, you know, data collectors feel that they need to collect a lot of data. We have to be mindful of that. But we also have to be mindful of the fact that, yes, there are certain ways these technologies can be used that can be helpful, but we need to balance that with, you know, what is the harm that could potentially arise? And, and not to just think about it in terms of financial harm or in terms of these really extreme cases where, for example, people get arrested based on faulty facial recognition technology. Um, and also just, you know, just plain, you know, you know, racist thinking by certain certain law enforcement officials, for example. But also the fact is, um, I think that it's also thinking about how we need more data literacy. We need time to catch up to the fact that these technologies have such 
capabilities that we may not actually be aware of because many of us are are only being exposed to certain products now, right? That that demonstrate the power of AI, that show, you know, that maybe a snippet of what we what some people might think AGI will look like, right? So, you know, ChatGPT being the one where everyone all of a sudden was very much made aware that the computer can sound like a human being, right? Okay, Wendy, lightning round questions for you. Let's start with our first one. How do you think AI will evolve in the next five years? I think it depends what we do now and going forward. Um, I think there are a lot of different trajectories that are possible. What frustrates you the most in a streaming media experience? I actually really like my streaming experiences. And I, I think, you know, if anything, uh, sometimes the algorithm does not get what I like. I would say it overemphasizes certain aspects of what I've watched before. What is your favorite app to use in your downtime? I look at uh, Zillow a lot. It's fun to just kind of pick out a different place in the world and see what's available, like, right? Is that what you I do? I like looking at people's decor choices and learning about the eras of, of you know, how interior design has, has changed over time. I love Zillow. If you find my house, it would just be a mess. Kids' toys everywhere, so don't bother <laughs> looking it up. I promise you're not missing anything there. And finally, Wendy, what is something that you are hopeful for? I'm really hopeful for conversation and engagement around um, tech issues. I think it is really important for people to realize they're not data subjects, but they're actually data stakeholders because we co-create data, and therefore we should have a louder voice than we currently do about how things are going. Well, Wendy, I appreciate you having this discussion with me, and thank you for joining thank you, us. Thank you, David. This was great. That was Wendy Wong. You can find her book, We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age, in our podcast notes. Thank you to our producers, Joe Stella and Sam Susala, and our creative team, including Megan Golick and Carly Searles. Subscribe, drop a comment, leave a review, or let us know what you think about the podcast by emailing at podcasts at applause.com. We'll catch you next time.